Good time to find your seat. We're going to get started. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce the next session, a conversation with United States Senator Ted Cruz, conducted by uh, Washington Post uh, reporter and chief correspondent Dan Balls, known to many of you because when the Post had a presence here on a regular basis in, uh, in Texas, it was Dan Balls who was here, so I believe Southwest correspondent. So a familiar face, a great journalist, and we're very pleased to have him here as we had his colleague Karen Tumblety this morning with Senator Cornyn. Let me say a few words about Senator Cruz and then about Dan. We'll have them come out and we'll have a great hour-long conversation. Ted Cruz is the junior United States Senator from Texas, elected in 2012 to succeed the retiring Kay Bailey Hutchison. In the 113th Congress, he serves on the Armed Services, Judiciary, Commerce, Science and Transportation, and Rules and Administrations Committees. Born in Canada but raised in Houston, he has an undergraduate degree from Princeton University. After graduating from Harvard Law School, he clerked for Chief Justice William Rehnquist on the U.S. Supreme Court, worked at both the Federal Trade Commission and the U.S. Department of Justice under President George W. Bush. In 2003, Attorney General Greg Abbott appointed him the Solicitor General of Texas, a post he held for five years, longer than anyone in state's history. He was also the first Hispanic Solicitor General in Texas history, and at 32, he was also the youngest Solicitor General in the United States. This afternoon, Senator Cruz will be interviewed, as I said, by Dan Balls, the chief correspondent at the Washington Post and formerly the paper's national editor, political editor, White House correspondent, and Southwest correspondent. Previously, Dan reported for National Journal and the Philadelphia Inquirer. He's the co-author of two books, including the New York Times bestseller, The Battle for America 2008, a narrative history of that year's presidential campaign, and he's the recipient of both the American Political Science Association Award for Political Coverage and the Gerald R. Ford Award for Coverage of the Presidency, a native of Illinois. Dan has bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Houston. Please join me in welcoming United States Senator Ted Cruz and the Washington Post, Dan Balls. I swear. <laughs> Let me try it again. How about that? <laughs> Make some sort of a dramatic entrance. How about that? Please join me in welcoming U.S. Senator Ted Cruz and Dan Balls of the Washington Post. Now? Here we go. All right. Thank you, Senator. All right, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Good Evan. luck. Welcome to everybody, Senator. Welcome. Uh, we're, we're, we're glad you're here. It's good to be back in Austin, uh, where I lived for a few years, many years ago. So I think of it as um, at least a second or third home. So um, we have a lot of ground to cover um, in a relatively short amount of time, and we want to leave some time for questions from the audience. So um, I want to just start out with um, news of the news of the week, and that has to do with the threat from Islamic State and the debate that's been going on. Um, the, the President's strategy, as he puts it, is to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIS. Uh, you said famously a few weeks ago, we should bomb them back to the Stone Age. My question is, what's the practical difference between what you say and what the President says? <laughs> well, I, I, I wish they were far closer. I mean, one of the real challenges with the president's approach is that it has varied day to day. So it's true that was a component uh, of what he said in his address. But the previous week he had said that the hope was to reduce them to a level where they were manageable. And indeed the analogy he drew in that speech was an analogy to Yemen and Somalia, uh, neither of which are encouraging. Both Yemen and Somalia are in many ways failed states where terrorism is rampant. And, and my concern with the president's approach to ISIS. I, I think ISIS poses an extraordinary threat to our national security. And, and I think the President's approach has been fundamentally unserious. That, that what has characterized the foreign policy is really more of a photo op foreign policy than, than clear and distinct military objectives. But do you still think, in the light of his speech, that he is unserious about this? I, I, I do. Be, because in the course of the speech, the first third of the speech was focused on effectively trying to defend the Obama-Clinton foreign policy and the results of it. The second third of the speech was focused on really diminishing ISIS as largely a regional threat and, and only in the future potentially problematic for this country. And it was only at the end, you're right, he had a couple of phrases in there 
about destroying ISIS that I was glad to hear. Uh, he also talked about arming the Kurds. I think that is very positive. We should have been doing that a long time ago. But much of the rest of the speech focused on peripheral issues that were unrelated to our national security objectives. But then go back to the first question. What does it mean to bomb them back to the Stone Age? What, in, in, a, in a military sense, what does that mean? Well, let me answer it in reference to a hearing we had the Senate Armed Services Committee this past week, mm -hmm. where both Secretary Hagel and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Dempsey, testified. And, and, and the question I asked them, if the objective were to destroy ISIS, not to degrade them, not to make them manageable, but to destroy them, to take them out. And if the objective were to do so in 90 days, what would be required militarily? The answer General Dempsey gave, he said, it's impossible, it can't be done. I said, okay, fine, if 90 days is not a reasonable time frame, then how would you destroy them? In whatever time frame, from your military judgment, it would take to accomplish that. And his answer, it was a very frustrating answer, he said, there is no military solution to this. We can't solve this problem till we change the conditions on the ground where people are not susceptible to being radicalized. Why do you think he's wrong about that? Because I think it is a hopelessly utopian goal. But then, right? what, but, but then what, you say we should bomb. You don't want ground troops. You're against arming the Free Syrian Army. Um, well, let's, what, let's, what, let's, what, let's, let's. Is there, is there a military person that has outlined to you a strategy that's in line with what you are saying rhetorically? Let's take the pieces one at a time, starting with arming the Syrian rebels. Now, the president has been advocating arming the so-called moderate Syrian, Syrian rebels for some time. And, and throughout the course of the discussion, what I have endeavored to ask repeatedly, both publicly and in classified situations, is how do you distinguish the good guys from the bad guys? Last summer, when the president was urging a unilateral attack on Syria, at the time, in June of last summer, of the nine major rebel groups, seven of them had significant alliances or connections to al-Qaeda or to al-Nusra or, or to other radical Islamic groups like ISIS. Consistently, the administration has not been able to give a satisfactory answer to well, how you distinguish the good guys from the bad guys. And my point is, Trying to resolve the Syrian civil war should not be the objective. And in fact, arming one set of rebels, those rebels are fighting literally alongside ISIS on the same side against Assad. It doesn't make any sense. What the objective should be, I believe, is not trying to resolve the, the Syrian civil war, nor should the objective be trying to achieve reconciliation between Sunnis and Shiites. Sunnis and Shiites have been engaged in a sectarian civil war since 632 A.D. But does the United States have no role in trying to help produce a functioning government in Iraq? I, I don't think it is our job to engage in nation building, to go and try to turn... So, so George W. Bush was wrong in that effort? I, I, I think we stayed too long and we got far too involved in nation building. Right. It is not our job to turn foreign nations into... We shouldn't be trying to turn Iraq into Switzerland. What we should be doing if there are people who pose a clear and present danger to our national security, and I believe ISIS qualifies as that, then the objective should be taking out that threat. And, and the consistent failure, I think, of the Obama-Clinton foreign policy is that it has failed to focus on U.S. national security interests, that it gets distracted with political objectives rather than just protecting the interest of this country. On one issue, the Clinton-Obama foreign policy diverged, and that was arming the rebels. She was in favor of it, he was against. You seem like you are much closer to the president's view of that issue. Well, they're, they're now one and the same, uh, because he is now advocating and, and doing exactly what, what but, she was apparently But you advocating. think he was right at the time not to do it? Well, his, his reason, look, I wasn't part of those internal discussions, so I'm not going to opine on, on discussions in rooms I wasn't sitting in. But a lot of people who were not part of those, including a lot of people in your party, have been quite critical of him for not having done it at the time. I, I am not one of those who has been critical of not arming the rebels. I think, all right, let's take, let's take a year ago. Last year when the president proposed a unilateral military attack on Syria. What I said at the time is, well, I want to hear the president's arguments. I want to hear how this furthers our U.S. national security interest. I want to keep an open mind. 
So I listened to the arguments and repeatedly, one of the things, every time the administration justified it, they focused on international norms, they focused on international law rather than U.S. national security interests. So when I asked, if you're picking rebels to arm, how do you tell who's a good guy and who's a bad guy? They never had any, any real answer to that. And moreover, we saw last summer, they vacillated between two poles, neither of which made sense. So at one point, you had John Kerry famously saying the objective was to launch a, quote, unbelievably small attack. A pinprick. A pinprick, in which case, look, it is basically treating our army as issuing a press release of disapproval. I don't think it's the job of the military to do unbelievably small attacks that are press releases. But on the flip side, and this is a question I asked over and over again, if we engage in a serious attack and the attack succeeds in toppling Bashar Assad, look, Assad is a monster. There's no, no doubt about that. He's murdered over 100,000 of his own people. He's used chemical weapons against women and children. But if he were toppled and the chemical weapons he had fell into the hands of radical Islamic terrorists, if they fell into the hands of ISIS, that would be worse from U.S. national security interests. And, and consistently, the administration couldn't answer that. And the enemy of my enemy is not necessarily my friend. Just because Assad's a bad guy doesn't mean the rebels fighting against him are good guys. In the vote this week, we saw a very unusual grouping which linked you and Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders together uh, in voting against the CR. They, they call us the three amigos. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the new axis. <laughs> it's the axis of something. Of something. Um, I take it we won't see many more of those times when the three of you are together. But uh, well, again, look, I, I will go, say this go, actually, go forward, go forward on this. Um, you don't trust the generals in what they're saying about this. You don't trust the president. Um, you, have a, you have a rhetorical idea of what we should be done, but you don't have a plan either. Well, and, and let's be clear on a couple of things. Let me say, say something quickly on Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. Um, I actually respect both of them a great deal because both of them, I think, are honest about what they believe. They, they are unapologetically on the left, and I respect that. Um, I think there are far too many politicians in Washington in both parties who pretend to be something different back home than they are in Washington. And I think both Bernie and Elizabeth run honestly based on their principles and beliefs. And, and I would far rather uh, a Senate with, with a lot more Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warrens, but also a lot more unapologetic, honest conservatives than, than, than a Senate right now where there is a disconnect between what people say and do in Washington and what they say and do at home. Now, getting to your specific question, listen. General Dempsey is speaking as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And unfortunately, his answers to the Senate Armed Services Committee are almost consistently political. They are almost consistently whatever the talking points are that are coming from the White House. They weren't, and, they weren't, they weren't on message when he talked about the possible necessity of combat involvement by U.S. forces. There. Well, they were, uh, that has been an issue on which the administration has been all, all over the the field. I can tell you I have visited with a number of military leaders who have expressed sentiments very much along this line. Now, I'm not going to out who I'm talking to. I don't think that would be a fair or reasonable thing to say. I don't want to make the whole conversation about ISIS. Let me ask you one exit question on this topic. Yeah. Um, United States role in the world. Indispensable nation, but not policemen. Do we go it alone in something like this? Do we build a large coalition that comes with obvious constraints whenever you try to do a coalition? How do you, and, and, and what kind of a timetable do you put on trying to do what you said we need to do? Well, I like the way you phrased it, of indispensable nation, but not the world's policeman. I am very much an American exceptionalist. I think we should be a clarion voice for freedom in the world. And I think we should be reluctant, even very reluctant, to engage in military force. But that at the same time, we should be willing and prepared to defend this nation and defend our national security. Now, in terms of a specific timetable, that, that, that ultimately has to come from the military planners. I'm not suggesting that I'm a military planner. It's why I asked At some at point, hearing, you will accept that they have, a, that, the, that the military leadership has a plan? Well, at, at this point, they haven't laid out a plan. At least the chairman of the Joint Chiefs haven't. That's why 
the Senate Armed Services role as an oversight role, I was pressing General Dempsey right. to, lay it, to answer the question. And his answer, indeed, look, his answer, there is no military solution to this. You saw the chairman, Senator Levin, step in and, and correct me. You mean the answer is not only military? Because you could see the chairman recognizing that the answer was not making a whole lot of sense. Right. And, and it was because, listen, I think the general's a good man, but I think he was following political talking points. And ultimately, you need military leaders who are focused on a concrete military objective. It's a very t difficult job here because what he ab appears to be being told by his civilian leadership is an objective that is follow the plan of, of Yemen and Somalia, hit them here, hit them there, but don't execute a clear, direct objective at the end of the day. Okay. Let's move to immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2001, this state was either the first or one of the first to enact the law that allows resident Texas children of illegal immigrants to pay in-state tuition. Mm -hmm. Uh, it passed initially in the House 142 to 1. It passed in the Senate 27 to 3. Uh, you have said you oppose this act. Mm -hmm. Can you explain why? Sure. Uh, I, I don't think that the taxpayers should be subsidizing the education of people who are here illegally at the expense of American citizens and at the expense of legal in immigrants. Is there any evidence that this has been bad for the state of Texas, that it's, that it's been unduly expensive at, as opposed to helping a group of children who might otherwise have difficulty paying for college go through college? Look, as, as a matter of policy, I think we should be directing U taxpayer resources to U.S. citizens and to those who are here legally. I'm the son of an immigrant who 57 years ago came legally from Cuba to come to the University of Texas. And he came on a student visa, and he paid his way through school washing dishes, making 50 cents an hour. Why do you I, think it passed so overwhelmingly here? I, you know, I don't know. I wasn't serving in the legislature. No, the I understand time. that. But, so. I mean, you've, you've, you've thought about this issue. You know what the culture of this state is in terms of the relationship between the Hispanic community, the Anglo community. Um, I mean, that, that, that was not a partisan vote. It was not a close right. vote. Not having served in an elected position at that time, I don't know what the discussion or debate was at that time. On the question of as a policy matter, is it a good idea to subsidize those who are here illegally at the expense of those who are here legally? I don't believe it is. Do you think it should be repealed? Would you urge the legislature here to repeal it? You know, one of the things I've tried to do is leave questions of state law to the state legislature and to the governor. I'm a big believer in federalism. And in fact, one thing I tell state legislators all the time is, is I'm not it, asking if for you to dictate that they do that. No, I mean, but, I, but and you, I, listen, you're usually I've, not unwilling to give opinions on those sorts of oh, things. Oh, you'd be surprised how unwilling I am. Uh, you know, there, <laughs> you, there, there are Mark a lot of down. questions <laughs> that, that, that are questions for the state, and that's why we have a state legislature. And I'm a big believer in federalism. And part of the reason I'm a believer in federalism is that I think decisions ought to be at the lowest level of government, where they are most accountable, where they're closest to the people, and where they allow all 50 states to serve, as, as Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis put it, as laboratories of democracy. Right. Well, then let's, let's, let's turn it then toward the federal level. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Republican platform, national platform in 2012, I believe said that there should be no federal funding of higher education for states that have laws like this, uh, which presumably would mean that people here in Texas would not get Pell Grants. Uh, is that something that you think people who are running for president in 2016 should endorse? Uh, look, I'll, I'll confess that is an issue I haven't studied. And I'm generally pretty skeptical of the federal government trying to put strings on federal money to compel the states to change their policies. So if that were, if somebody said we should put that in the platform again, you would say no? Uh, look, as, as I said, it's not an issue I've studied, so I'm not, I'm not going to Right, but it's a fairly a, straightforward. A, 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 my reaction is that I am skeptical of federal strings on money coming to the states trying to impose a uniform federal policy. Okay. If President Obama goes ahead after the election mm -hmm. and acts through executive power on immigration that includes some kind of legal status, mm -hmm. if only temporary, for millions of mm -hmm. undocumented uh, people, what's the Republican response? What do you all do? You know, I don't know, and I think the best response is not after the election. The best response is in November, 45 days from today. Um, Do you well, think the outcome of that election will deter him? 
I think the outcome of the election in many ways will hinge on the question of amnesty. What the president has announced in no uncertain terms is that it is his intention to unilaterally grant amnesty to somewhere between five and six million people who are here illegally. Public opinion is on his side. Uh, it's, it's actually not, Dan, and it's not even remotely. There is a reason why Democratic senators begged him, please don't do this before the election. In, mostly in the red states. I mean, they don't, you, obviously you, it's you, a volatile issue. You mean red states like New Hampshire? It's, obviously it's a volatile no, issue. I understand injecting it in the middle of the campaign. But, but it's, it's not just a volatile issue. It is the numbers are 70, 30 or higher against granting amnesty. It's not, public opinion is not on its side. Through executive order. I, yes, which is what the president is proposing doing. Right. And he has no legal authority to do so. But and, again, and, what should, and, and you but, know what, but let's, let, there's going to be an election that's going to have an outcome. Um, he has said he will act after the election. You're, you're, you're saying you don't believe that he will do that if they uh, no, if the no, Republicans I'm not, I'm, win I'm the I'm not Senate. saying that. What I'm saying is his announcing that he's going to illegally grant amnesty, and he has no legal authority to do so, but then saying he's going to delay it until after the election, I think is one of the most cynical acts we've ever seen. You know, I talked before about praising Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren because they're being honest and direct. In saying he's going to commit this illegal action but wait until after the election, what that's effectively saying is that he doesn't think very highly of the American voters. He doesn't think people can look ahead and, and they won't notice. And, and look, there is a frustration in this country. It's here in Texas and it's across the country. It's a frustration with career politicians in both parties, both Democrat and Republican, and the frustration is they're not listening to us and they're lying to us. And this is a manifestation of that, we'll, where he knows we'll, the we'll, American people strongly disagree, and so he's basically trying to trick them after the election. But again, what should Republicans do if he goes ahead to do it? Well, we just had a vote this week. I introduced legislation in the Senate to make absolutely clear in federal law that the president has no authority to grant amnesty to anyone who's here illegally. The House of Representatives stood up and led. They took the legislation that I had introduced in the Senate and the House passed it. And then it went to the Senate, and Harry Reid and the Senate Democrats followed the pattern they have followed the last two years, which is they refused to allow a vote. In fact, Reid dismissed the Senate and sent all the senators home for August doing nothing on immigration. I think what we ought to do. But you think that legislation is needed, otherwise the courts might not rule in your favor on this? Without that legislation, where do you think the courts would be if this, uh, I if think this were challenged? I think his action is illegal, but like many of his actions, the courts have a challenge remedying them because you've got to have, you've got to find a plaintiff with standing. Right. You've got to find someone who has a concrete injury. So for example... So he's acting illegally, but there's no legal remedy for that? Is I, that what you're saying? It is difficult to find a remedy through the courts, and many of his lawless actions, and, and as you know, I'm the ranking member on the Constitution Subcommittee, the Senate Judiciary Committee. Right. We put out a series of reports detailing the lawlessness of this administration. And I think this ought to be a bipartisan concern. I mean, anyone who cares about checks and balances, anyone who cares about the constitutional restraints on the executive should be troubled with an administration that says, if I disagree with the law, I will not follow it or I will unilaterally change it. That is a dangerous precedent, and it's dangerous whether it's done by Democrats or Republicans. Healthcare. Um, this is one of many states that has not chosen to expand Medicaid under the uh, Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. There are an estimated million and a half people who would otherwise have health insurance if the state had done that. Um, what's the rationale for not providing that coverage? It's costing the state of Texas uh, about $65 billion over the next 10 years. Hospitals in this state are going to lose about $34 billion as a result of that. Well, you know, Dan, there are a lot of premises in that question that I don't agree with and that the data don't bear out. So, for example, you assumed if, if the state expanded Medicaid that you would have a substantial additional population getting health care coverage. You disagree with that? If you look at other states previously that have expanded Medicaid, what has happened in other states, and this is pre-Obamacare what the data demonstrates, is that what's happened is the private insurance market has been crowded out and people end up losing their private insurance and being pushed onto Medicaid and we have not seen in other states that have expanded Medicaid 
substantial increases in the number of people receiving but coverage. There are, but there is evidence that since the Affordable Care Act took effect, that states that have expanded have dropped the percentage of uninsured much more rapidly than states that chose not to go into Medicaid. I, look, I, I think that data is still being developed, and we'll all look at it when it is. One of the challenges is, <laughs> I, I, look, it, it, we have a federal government that does not answer the question how many of the people signing up under Obamacare previously had insurance. They know this, but they refuse to release the data, and part of the reason is north of six million people had their health insurance canceled under Obamacare. And so what happens is the federal government takes credit when you cancel six million people's insurance, and they end up going to the exchange and signing up for insurance that is more expensive, that has a higher deductible, that covers less, they count that as, look, we covered someone. There are a whole lot of Texans, a whole lot of people, when I travel the state, over and over again will come up to me and say, I had my health insurance canceled. And they're not happy about it. And part of the reason we don't have the data is the administration will not release the data. So what I can tell you is we do know the data from prior states that have expanded Medicaid. Well, let's, and, let's not and, get into a statistical Well, but your, the, the premise of your question was based on statistics. Yes, it was. <laughs> Some of those statistics, I think, are accurate. You obviously don't, so we, we, I want to move on slightly beyond that. Um, this, there, there is no question that this state has one of the highest percentages of uninsured in the country. Uh, when I've talked to Governor Perry about Texas and his philosophy is we are a low tax, low regulation, we believe in free enterprise, we are a low services state as a result. If people don't like it, they can leave. Uh, is that, I mean, is that, do you share that philosophy? I, I think there's a reason that a thousand people a day are moving to Texas. Texas is where the jobs are. You know, one of the reasons I talked before about federalism, one of the advantages of federalism is we have 50 states, and different states can adopt policy solutions that reflect their values and mores. So if there are states. But I suspect a lot of the people who have these jobs don't have health insurance. Well, but, but what's interesting is they're choosing to be here. There are states who, if a state wants to adopt government-provided socialized health care, I think it's entirely within a state's constitutional authority to do so. But people vote with their feet. They go where they want to. Now, if the question is, do we need health care reform, we absolutely need health care reform. Do you think that uh, universal or near-universal coverage uh, is the right goal? I don't think it is from government, but I think we need serious health care reform. I think the first thing we need to do is repeal Obamacare in its entirety. And after that... That's not a new position. Uh, it, it, it is not, and I know you're astonished to know uh, that, that I'm not a fan of Obamacare. Um, I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been sort of on the fence on that one. We're, we're, uh, we're glad to get you off the fence here today. But beyond that... Look, I think there is serious interest in, in health care reform that expands competition, that expands access, and that makes policies personal, portable, and affordable. If you want more access, the single biggest barrier to access is cost. If you look in Texas, if you look in the other states, people who don't have insurance, they cite as the reason I can't afford it. If you want more access, what you want is more choices and lower costs. What Obamacare does is it has fewer choices and higher costs. So the reforms I think we ought to pursue is, number one, allowing people to purchase health insurance across state lines. Now, that's one reform. Right now, that's illegal. What that would do is create a true national 50-state marketplace, which would let people purchase low-cost, catastrophic plans. It wouldn't cover day-to-day -day health care needs, but if, God forbid, you get some horrible disease, you're in some terrible accident, the insurance plan would be there for that. Secondly, we should expand health savings accounts so people can save in a tax-advantaged way for more day-to-day -day health care needs. And third, we should work to de-link health insurance from employment. As you know, Dan, it's an historical accident that health insurance is tied to employment. It came out of World War II when you had wage and price controls in effect, and, and employers were trying to recruit new employees. They couldn't raise wages, so they began offering health insurance as a way to do it. The problem is we don't live in the 1950s anymore. We don't live in a society where someone goes and works for a company for 40 years and gets a gold watch. We live in a mobile society. We live in a society where people work in different industries, work for different companies. And if you or I lose our jobs, we don't lose our car insurance. We don't lose our house insurance. We don't lose our life insurance. 
there's no reason on earth we should lose our health insurance. And of all of them, it's the worst one to lose because much of the problem with pre-existing conditions comes from people who lose their job and then can't get new insurance. And so if we delink that, we could have plans that are personal, portable, and affordable, and that would expand access rather than going the direction Obamacare is going. You obviously will have to wait until, you'll have to wait until obviously 2017 to be able to do that because the president would most likely veto most of the things that you're talking about, certainly the repeal. There is an election before that. Um, Senator Clinton was in Iowa, or Secretary Clinton was in Iowa last weekend. She said the choice in this election is between, quote, the guardians of gridlock, she did not name names, but uh, versus the champions of shared opportunity. How do you characterize the choice that's coming up? You know what, I actually think her, her characterization is precisely accurate. You were just... No, I, look, folks in the press, love to characterize gridlock in Washington and say, listen, it's both parties. That, 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 that's the easy tit for tat, everyone's to blame. I don't think the facts bear that out. The House of Representatives has passed over 350 pieces of legislation, most of those with bipartisan support, many of those focused on jobs and economic opportunity and growth. Over 350 pieces of legislation are sitting on Harry Reid's desk as majority leader, Harry Reid has absolute control over what the Senate votes on. He will not allow us to vote on anything. We have gridlock in Washington, that is true, but it is because Harry Reid and the Democrats have presided over a do-nothing Senate. You don't it, think it has anything to do with the Tea Party faction in the House, of which you have been an outside advisor? I, well, I don't agree that I've been an outside advisor, but listen, you've got 350 bills. An inside advisor. I, <laughs> I am happy to offer my advice to anyone who will listen. But, 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 I mean, let's take for a second. There are 350 pieces of legislation. What's the major, what's the biggest of those 350? What, what is the most significant of that group? Oh, I mean, there are hosts of them focusing on, I mean, we can point to a couple. One we just had a vote on right now was dealing with amnesty, solving the, pre the, the crisis at the border cr uh, caused by the president's amnesty. The House voted to make clear in law the president doesn't have the authority to, to have amnesty. Harry Reid refused to allow a vote on that. Right. Another example is building the Keystone Pipeline. We should have built the Keystone Pipeline years ago. It would create tens of thousands of high-paying jobs. There's one reason and one reason only that hasn't passed, and it is because Harry Reid will not allow a vote on that. Yeah. A, a year ago, you were in the middle of the shutdown of the government. Uh, Senator Cornyn was here this morning and said to my colleague, Karen Tumulty, that he thinks that at this point there's widespread agreement that that was a mistake. Um, I've heard you talk about this and you don't think it was a mistake, but why? I, let me be clear. I, I think it was very much a mistake for President Obama and Harry Reid to shut down the government. <laughs> and, and, and I, ho hold on a second, hold on a second. Uh, you know, it's always good to have the joys of open discussion. <laughs> I recognize that in media reports, the shutdown is always, always, always blamed on Republicans, that that's taken as gospel truth. What I can tell you is that House Republicans voted over and over and over again to fund the federal government. I voted over and over and over again to fund the federal government. And the reason we had a shutdown is that President Obama and Harry Reid made a political determination. They thought a shutdown would be beneficial to them. And they said this publicly over and over again. We think a shutdown helps the Democrats. And so their position throughout the entire issue was we will not negotiate, we will not compromise. Do you think they were right in that political judgment? I actually don't. Although, and, and, because? and I would point, because the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding right now. I believe we are 45 days away from an historic victory for Republicans in November. And I think a major reason for that is that Obamacare has plummeted in the polls. It has plummeted with young people, with Hispanics. It has plummeted with independents. It has plummeted with Democrats. And I think the fight last fall that elevated the national debate of the millions of Americans who'd lost their jobs, who'd been forced into part-time work, who'd lost their health care, who'd lost their doctors, who've seen their premiums skyrocket, I think that has played a critical piece. Right now, the reason Democrats are in such peril of losing 
the Senate is because Obamacare hangs like an albatross around their necks. Well, let me ask you, uh, as a counter to that, I mentioned that I was in Iowa last weekend. Joni Ernst, the Republican mm -hmm. nominee for Senate, very tough race against Congressman Braley. She came out with a new ad this week <clears throat> in which she talks about she is in favor of protecting Social Security, she's in favor of good schools, good paying jobs, and health care that people can afford. At no time did she talk about getting rid of Obamacare. Never used the word Obamacare, didn't talk about the law at all. What does that tell you? What it tells me, I agree with everything she's in favor of. What I just said a minute ago is we ought to have affordable health care and people are no, losing their health care under Obamacare. No, but what I'm wondering is if, if, if Obamacare is as powerful a motivating force in the election as you say, why wouldn't a Republican in a tough race in a you know swing state um, use that in a television commercial 50 days out from the election? You know what, I, I, look, I haven't seen the particular ad you're talking about. Joni Ernst and candidates all over the country have been making very clear their opposition to Obamacare, and there's a reason Democrats are running away from it. You know, there's an ad running in New Hampshire right now that says, if you like your senator, you can keep your senator. I don't know that there's a Democratic senator in the country in any contested race who is running saying we were the champions of Obamacare because it is right now at 37% approval rating because it's not working. You know, one of the things, Dan, that I, that I try to do when, when I'm back home is across the state we host small business roundtables, and we'll typically get 20, 25 small business owners sitting around a table. And the way we do them is I ask folks to go around the table and I say, just introduce yourself and then share an issue that's weighing on your heart, share an issue you're thinking about, you're praying about. We've done 20 some odd of these roundtables. We've never done a small business roundtable in Texas where at least half of the small business owners around the table don't describe Obamacare as the single biggest impediment in their business to job creation. So, so let me tell a quick anecdote. We did one in Kerrville, Texas, in the Hill Country, Central Texas. We were meeting in a restaurant bar, the owner of the restaurant bar, husband and wife. They said, we had a great opportunity to expand our business, to double the size of it. From a business perspective, we thought it was a fantastic opportunity. We've already turned it down. They said, the reason is we have between 35 and 40 employees right now. If we expand the business, we'll cross over the threshold of 50 employees. And at 50 employees, we're under Obamacare. Obamacare will drive us out of business. In Kerrville, the first four or five people around the table, every one of them described the same scenario where they had between, say, 35 and 45 employees. They had a great business opportunity, and they weren't expanding because of that. Now, run that over millions of small businesses. And by the way, the people being hurt are not just those small business owners. It's all of the people, frankly, like my dad. It's the teenage kids washing dishes who don't get hired as a dishwasher or a bellhop or a waitress. It's the single moms. It's all of the people that aren't getting those jobs on the first and second rung of, of, the, of the economic ladder to achieve the American dream. Another woman around that table over on the right, she owns several fast food restaurants, uh, fried chicken restaurants. She already had substantially more than 50 employees, so, she, so that was not an option to her. She described how she had already forcibly reduced her employees' hours to 28, 29 hours a week because Obamacare kicks in at 30 hours a week. And this woman began to choke up. She said, listen, many of these employees have been with us five or 10 years. These are single moms. These are people who are struggling. They can't feed their kids on 28, 29 hours a week. But she said, you know what? They can't feed their kids if I go out of business either. That is what is happening across the state of Texas and across the country, and it is the people being hurt the most by the Obama economy are the most vulnerable among us. It's young people, it's Hispanics, it's African Americans, it's single moms, it's everyone who's struggling but wants to achieve the American dream, and I think that's what we need to change. Let me ask you about the Republican Party um, and the the so-called war within the Republican Party. I know you have dismissed the idea that this is a establishment versus insurgency within the party, that this is really outside Washington versus inside Washington. But there have been a series of primary battles in the Republican Party this year in Senate races. Mm -hmm. uh, the Tea Party back candidates have lost every single one of them. What does that tell you? Oh, it tells me that, that look, each race is peculiar to the race. And, and the races you're talking about, I stayed out of, of just about all of those. I, I stayed out yeah. of any race 
But with you an don't, you don't disagree that these were Tea Party versus establishment in most respects? Uh, I, I, there were certainly a lot of folks who characterized it as that. Um, in most of the races, the challenger that was perceived as a Tea Party challenger was vastly, was overwhelmingly, was massively outspent. And, and if you do not have money to communicate your message in politics, it is almost impossible to win. And so a lot of these races, it wasn't complicated looking where you have a challenger who's being outspent 10 to 1. They don't have a prayer of winning. Listen, I mean, I know very well in but the these state were, of these Texas. Were, these were not races cast in the way you've described it as hating Washington or loving Washington. These were, these were races in which one type of conservatism was pitted against another type. But, but it's not pitted against if the voters don't hear the message. I mean, let me give an example from here in Texas. We had a Senate primary two years ago. It was the most expensive primary in the country, a $50 million primary. I was outspent three to one. There was $35 million in attack ads run against me. Y'all will remember. Uh, yet, you know, at, at, at one point, watching all the attack ads, my wife Heidi came home and, and looked at me and said, goodness gracious, I didn't realize you were such a rotten guy. <laughs> we were outspent three to one, but we also raised $9.5 million in that primary. In fact, astonishingly, in that primary, we outraised my principal opponent, the Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst. He raised nine million, we raised nine and a half. The difference was his nine came from 3,000 donors. Our nine and a half came from 34,000 donors. Now, he wrote a $25 million check on top of that. Uh, so the differential wasn't there, but my point is, if you have a heads up battle between two candidates, you've got to have some level of parity on the money front or else the challenger gets squashed. And in just about every one of these races, the disparity was so great that it was not surprising to anyone uh, that, that the challenger did, did not have a real chance of winning. Do you anticipate that this is a contest within the Republican Party that we will continue to see play out, particularly in 2016 in the nomination battle? Oh, I think there have always been battles within the Republican Party, within the Democratic Party, in terms of what does the party stand for. Right. Uh, what I'm far more interested in is changing the culture of Washington. I think Washington is broken. I think Washington is fundamentally corrupt. And what we have seen is those with power and influence, those who have influence in the Obama administration, are getting fat and happier. The, the counties around Washington, D.C. are getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And working men and women are finding their lives harder and harder. And a, as you noted, how do you, th I, how do you think you unify a country that is as divided as <clears throat> this country is today. I mean, President Bush uh, went to Washington and said, I'm a uniter, not a divider. Mm -hmm. um, President Obama said, I'm going to try to change the culture of Washington. Uh, neither succeeded. Um, wh what does it take at this point, and are campaigns likely to be run in a way that will make it possible to govern mm -hmm. in a united way after they're over? I, I think the only way to do it is to take the case to the American people. I, I think Washington will not- And accept not... the consequences? Yes, but, but, but my point is change, change the decision making. Wash, the answer is not going to come from Washington. I, as you noted before, I think the biggest divide in politics is not between Democrats and Republicans. I think the biggest divide is between career politicians in Washington in both parties and the American people, and so I, I would not disagree with that. But um, I mean, I, 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 you know, seventy-five percent of the country dislikes Washington immensely: liberals, conservatives, Republicans, Democrats, yeah. Independents. When they vote, when they are given a choice, they line up on one or the other side, and in, in a much more intense and passionate way, and looking at the opposition in a much more negative way. It's common in both parties. How do we get past that? There will always be partisan divisions. But the analogy, I think, where we are now. But if we, but if we cast every election as, if my opponent wins, the world as we know it will end, which is a lot of the way campaigns are now run, that, that makes it difficult after that election for the losing side to accept the outcome and say, OK, let's, let's try to patch things up and go forward. Well, look, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. It depends on how it's phrased. I think politics is very legitimate to have policy disagreements, to say the policy being advocated by my opponent 
is not good policy, it's hurting the American people. I think that is qualitatively different from the nasty personal attacks that so often occur in politics. And, and the approach that I have tried to take to Washington is to keep the focus on the substance. If, if you know, you may have noticed once or twice uh, some, some un unkind words have been directed in my direction. I can't control that, but my response to that is that I'm not going to reciprocate. I'm not going to impugn the character or integrity of any member of the Senate, Republican or Democrat. And in terms of how we turn things around, I think the answer, I think where we are today bears striking similarities to the late 1970s. I think there are strong parallels between Jimmy Carter and Barack Obama, both with the same failed economic policies that have produced stagnation, misery, and malaise, and the same foreign policy that has been feckless and naive and has made the world more dangerous. And what happened in the late 70s was millions of men and women who hadn't been involved in politics came together as a grassroots revolution and became the Reagan revolution. And it didn't come from Washington. So your answer, how do we unite people? I think the only way to change the course of the country and the only way to unite people is for the millions of Americans who haven't been showing up voting, the millions of Americans who feel like Washington isn't listening, to stand up and say, we're going to hold our elected officials accountable in both parties, and we're going to go a different direction. We're going to go back to the free market principles and constitutional liberties the country was founded on. And Reagan, ultimately, it was a bitter race between Reagan and Carter, but yet the American people were energized such that it turned the country around. I want to follow up on that, but I, I want to turn to the audience shortly. So if people want to line up at the microphones, uh, we'll have a little bit of time for some questions in a few minutes. Um, you, you, you've mentioned Ronald Reagan. Um, you have, as anybody who's seen The New Yorker or been in your office, a huge painting of Ronald Reagan at the Brandenburg Gate where he uttered the famous words, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Um, you are obviously an admirer of Ronald Reagan for somebody who, who painted in primary colors, who mm -hmm. created a bold agenda. Uh, there was also the Ronald Reagan who compromised. Mm -hmm. As governor of California, um, he signed a bill liberalizing abortion, signed a hefty tax increase, one of the biggest in California history. As president, the year after uh, his budgeted tax program was enacted, he signed a significant tax increase. He signed the uh, immigration bill that a lot of people look back on and think was a mistake. Um, do you have it within you to be the kind of compromiser that Ronald Reagan was? Yeah, absolutely yes. And from day one, I've said, look, I, I get that, that, that folks like to paint a caricature, that, that, that Cruz doesn't compromise. The, the New Yorker article headline was the absolutist. I is that an unfair characterization? Uh, well, it's nothing that's ever come out of my mouth. Every time I'm asked about compromise, my answer is the same, which is my view is exactly what Reagan's was. He was asked, what do you do if they offer you half a loaf? His answer was, you take it, and then you come back for more. And my view is I'm absolutely happy to compromise with anyone, Republican, Democrat, Independent, Libertarian, if they are shrinking the size and power of the federal government, if they are improving the conditions of jobs and economic growth, I'll take less than 100 percent. The president what, has often said, I'm willing to work with anyone who's willing to work with me. And Republicans have read that as he's willing to work with anybody who will do it on his terms, only on his terms. Uh, are, are you, is that what you're saying, a version of that? No, but what I'm, no, it, it's not because his view is, and, and this has been the condition the last two years, he will not even discuss, so for example, in budget dis discussions, he, he has said, the White House has told Republicans, all entitlement programs are off the table. I'm unwilling to discuss them in any way, shape, or form. He was, un he was willing to talk about them in the summer of 2011 during that debt ceiling debate. I, look, I wasn't, I wasn't there in the summer of 2011. I can tell you what they're the, saying the, now is we're unwilling to talk about it. The record is pretty clear, though, that he, he, and, he and Speaker Boehner had a uh, series of serious conversations about entitlements. Uh, my view on compromise, there are some folks in Washington who compromise for the sake of a deal, and I don't think a compromise is good if it makes things worse, if it grows the government debt, if it, if it kills economic growth, if it kills jobs. So, for example, on the, on the Simpson-Bowles Commission, mm -hmm. um, which is a, was, was well regarded when it came out by people on both sides, that called for a, a combination of spending cuts, significant spending cuts, and some revenue increases. 
um, the so-called balanced approach to dealing with deficits, debt, and entitlements. Do you think that's a good solution? I think it was a good faith attempt, but I don't think we need higher taxes. I think our greatest challenge in this country right now economically but is stagnant. then in what way would you be moving in, at, in part toward the Democrats who clearly believe that some revenue is necessary? Because... As, as do some Republicans. Very few Republicans. Well, um, Speaker Boehner was prepared to do $800 billion in new revenue. He and I are not always on the same page. <laughs> I, I, my number one priority in office from the day I've been elected has been economic growth. Since World War II, the economy has grown on average 3.3% a year. There are only two four-year periods where economic growth has averaged less than 1% in four consecutive years. 1979 to 1982, coming out of Jimmy Carter, and 2008 to 2012, where it averaged 0.9% a year. Now, what, what I have... Well, let, me, let, me, let me offer a different set of statistics. The Reagan years, we saw robust growth for several years, mm -hmm. averaging 4% a year mm -hmm. several years. The Clinton years, mm -hmm. we also saw similar. Clinton raised taxes in his first term with not a single Republican vote. So in other words, they had different strategies but both managed to achieve economic growth in, in the time they were in office. But the economic growth under Clinton didn't come because he raised taxes. It came in spite of raising taxes because there were how, other factors that were being driven, such as reducing government spending, going from a deficit to a surplus, such, such as reining in government regulations. And of course, a lot of that growth happened after 94 when you had a Republican Congress that reined in a lot of Clinton, Clinton's excesses. Well, we, I mean, some of it, some of it began but, first. But, but, I want to, I want to, I want to, I know everybody wants to know the answer to this question. You, you, you told Wolf Blitzer recently when he asked you about 2016. I think 2016 will be the most important election of your lifetime and my lifetime. It will be a fork in the road where Americans will decide, do we want to continue on this path, that failed path that isn't working? Or do we want to get back to the principles this country was built on that have made America the greatest country in the history of the world? Um, if it is that important an election, what would keep you out of it? <laughs> That's a clever way of asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> For the next 45 days, I am focused directly on retaking the Senate on traveling the country. I believe I'm, I'm Republicans prepared to have stipulate that. What, an what historic are, opportunity what to are the, the What are the criteria that you are and will consider about whether you run? Let me answer it this way. I think Republicans in 2016 should nominate whoever is standing up and leading. Whoever is leading, whoever is making the case that the economic policies we're seeing are not working that the assault on our constitutional liberties from Washington is unacceptable, that the retreat of American leadership in the world is making the world more dangerous and is jeopardizing America. Margaret Thatcher famously said, first you win the argument, then you win the vote. And, and it is my hope, I mean, listen, by any measure, there are a dozen or so Republicans, senators, governors who seem to be thinking about it. But none who have articulated the choice in quite the way you have. Well, what I would encourage everyone thinking about it to do is stand up and lead. I would be thrilled if a year from now we had a half dozen Republicans who were making the case and taking it to young people, to Hispanics, to single moms, and making the case, look, what we're doing isn't working. There is a better way. If we get back to the free market principles, the constitutional liberties this country was founded on, we can bring you'll, back economic you'll, you'll growth. Have to make a, I think you'll have to make a decision well before a year from now on that score. What's your timetable? You know, I think it is likely that we will see the field form sometime between January and June of next year. And, and that's your timetable? I think it is likely that's, that's, that's when the field will form. All right. Thank you. Let's turn it to the audience. Uh, we'll start here, and then we'll rotate back and forth. Yes, sir. If you, if you can't tell by my getup, I'm one of the millennials that everybody's talking about <laughs> during the conference. Um, so the next president of the United States is going to have to be a uniter. And I know whenever I get into passionate debates or arguments, uh, my mom often tells me, 
Michal, you're so confident. You're, you're so passionate. You, you don't even leave any leeway for somebody else to, for their ideas to be mm -hmm. part of your solution. Um, as somebody that's been criticized as being divisive, as part of your own party has criticized you as well as, as the other party, what does Ted Cruz need to do differently in messaging and tactics um, and execution to be seen as a uniter mm -hmm. um, so that if you did want to run for president, right. um, what do you need to do differently? What have you learned over the last few years that you can say, I need to change? Is there anything? And, and what do you... What do you believe you have changed, and what do you need to change to be seen, but also to be believed as that person? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that question. Um, look, I, I very much agree with the premise of the question, that we need to bring people together to address the shared problems we have, and they are enormous. Uh, and I also recognize, as you know, that, that there has been a picture painted of me in the press, I think a caricature. Um, as divisive or, or even further as sort of a, you know, wild-eyed lunatic with dynamite strapped around my chest. Um, I, and I left the dynamite outside, so don't worry about it. Um, you know, part of that I I is a function of the reality that there have historically been two caricatures that are used for Republicans. Republicans are characterized historically as either stupid or evil. So under the, the media narrative, Reagan was stupid, George W. Bush was stupid, Dan Quayle was stupid, Nixon was evil, Dick Cheney was evil. Now, look, there, there's some people nodding on that. You know, I actually think... <laughs> you know, I think one of the unfortunate things we see in our political debate is the degree of personal demonization. There are not really that many people who are either stupid or evil. And, and I think it hurts our political discourse when we caricature the other side rather than taking on the ideas substantively in terms of what makes a difference in people's lives. Now, I, I do take it as a bit of a backhanded compliment uh, that the press has to some extent invented a third caricature for me, uh, which is crazy. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, I, I, I don't think it's accurate. I think what we need to do is... is what I am trying to do is take the case directly to the people. I spend a lot of time doing town halls, doing roundtables, traveling the state of Texas, traveling the country, visiting directly using social media, because trying to get around the media filter, frankly, and speak directly to people, and that's something I think that, that I need to do a lot more of, and I think a lot of us need to do a lot more of. Over here. My name is Jordan Brown. I'm a graduate student at Texas State. Hey, Jordan. Um, and earlier you talked about the Tea Party candidates that lost in their primaries, and you said it was because they got grossly outspent. And I was wondering if that meant you and the Three Amigos would be co-sponsoring a bill to overturn Citizens United to get money out of politics so more <laughs> Tea Party candidates could win. I, you, know, you know, I'm curious, Jordan. There was a lot of applause in this room about overturning Citizens United. Um, Do you know what the underlying, what Citizens United was about, what the facts were that led to that case? You mean the ruling of the case that citizens are people, or that corporations count as people and they can spend unlimited amount of money? <laughs> no, that's, that's actually what, what you're told the ruling was, but... Senator, I'm, I'm told we're running out of time, so, uh, and I know you have a plane <laughs> well, to catch, well, so, but, 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 but I'm, go I'm, ahead, but I'm go ahead and answer, answer this I'm not question. cutting you off from the question, but... Listen, Citizens United, is a case that arose when, it, when a nonprofit company made a movie that was critical of Hillary Clinton. The name of the nonprofit corporation was Citizens United. It was a nonprofit corporation, just like the NAACP is a nonprofit corporation, just like the Sierra Club is a nonprofit corporation, just like Planned Parenthood is a nonprofit corporation, just like People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals is a nonprofit corporation. Because this nonprofit group made a me movie critical of Hillary Clinton, the federal government tried to impose civil and criminal fines on them for making a movie. And I'll tell you more broadly, we just had a week ago in the Senate a vote on the Senate floor for a constitutional amendment that was introduced by Democratic senators that would have repealed the free speech protections of the First Amendment. 
and it was breathtaking in its scope, I would encourage you, if you're interested in the issue, rather than listening to the caricatures, watch the debates in the Senate Judiciary Committee and in the Constitution Subcommittee on this amendment. Because I can tell you in the Constitution Subcommittee, I asked the chairman uh, of, the, uh, of the committee, Dick Durbin, who introduced this amendment, three questions. Should Congress have the constitutional authority to ban movies? Should Congress have the constitutional authority to ban books? And should Congress have the constitutional authority to ban the NAACP from speaking about politics? And I said, in my view, the answer to all three is unequivocally no, because I believe in the First Amendment. And yet the amendment that was introduced, and I encourage you to read the text of the amendment. The amendment that was introduced said, for any corporation, Congress could prohibit, and prohibit is the word that was in that amendment, that corporation from speaking about politics. Now, for movies, Paramount Pictures is a corporation. Under the text of it, Congress could say, you cannot make a movie making fun of politicians. Congress could pro prohibit Michael Moore from making his movies. I think they're silliness, but I think he's got a First Amendment right to make them. On books, Simon & Schuster is a corporation. Under the text of the amendment, Congress could prohibit Simon & Schuster from publishing a book. And, and let me note, look, I mean, a lot of the folks in this room are from Austin. Uh, Y'all may be not inclined to believe a Republican, especially a conservative Republican. And in fact, you may just not be inclined to believe any politician, which is a pretty healthy instinct. So if you're not inclined to believe me on this, perhaps you would believe that famed right-wing organization, the ACLU. The ACLU said in writing, and I'd encourage you to read their letter, which I entered in the congressional record, said in writing this amendment would fundamentally break the Constitution and destroy civil liberties for generations to come. And in fact, the ACLU said in writing this amendment would allow Congress to ban Hillary Clinton's new book, Hard Choices. Now, listen, I think that is astonishing that Congress is considering a constitutional amendment to allow banning books, and I'll tell you it was heartbreaking. When it came to a vote, out of 55 Democrats, do you know how many voted no? Zero. In 1997, a similar amendment was before Congress. <laughs> And there were a number of Democrats then, a number of liberals who actually stood up and defended free speech. Russ Feingold, a lion of the left, said, the Bill of Rights is not a rough draft. We have to stop treating it as such. Ted Kennedy said, we have not amended the Bill of Rights in over 200 years, and now is no time to start. I gave a floor speech on the Senate floor. I would commend to each of you with a giant picture of Ted Kennedy next to me and his quote, Scared the living daylights of my father, by the way. <laughs> and I asked the simple question, where are the Ted Kennedys? Where are the liberals? It is heartbreaking that we have a bipartisan system of two major parties, that one of the major parties, the Democratic Party in the Senate, you cannot find a single Democrat who would rise in defense of the First Amendment. So no, I don't think we should be silencing citizens from expressing their political views. I think it is a First Amendment right, and I think it's critical to democracy. And I'll note also, by the way, every time you see campaign finance laws put in place, the people who are benefited is incumbent politicians, because what it does is it silences the voices and empowers the incumbents. I'd much rather empower the people. Senator, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Uh, the Senator has a plane to catch, so we're going to scamper out of here, but uh, next session to come. Thank you all.